Again, good morning. We're glad you're with us as we're gathered together today to hear a word from God. So would you, with me, just briefly come together as we prepare our hearts and our minds. Gracious and loving God, speak to us today. We gather together with ears open, hearts softened to hear what it is you have to say to us today. And may each of us hear the word you have for us. So Lord, speak. And may we hear and be transformed more into the likeness of your son, Jesus. In his precious and holy name, amen. Well, let me begin by saying happy Father's Day. We are so glad you are with us on this day. Um, On this day, it seems, I don't know if I'm the only one, but on this day, uh, I seem to, leading up to this day even, I seem to um, go into these states of reminiscence, of remembering um, my two girls, what it meant to become a father with Caitlin and then with Casey and the 27 and the 22 years that have come after that. And uh, um, just as Joanna and I watched them grow and some of the struggles I had as a dad, um, learning what it meant to be a father. Um, some things went great, some things not so great. I mean, I come from a family of all boys. I don't have any girl cousins. Um, so when that first daughter popped out, I wasn't sure she was quite done baking yet. Um, so it was all new to me. And as we've grown, as they've grown, and as I've grown as a father, the the thing that I've always wanted for my girls was for them uh, to be happy, uh, for them to be joyful, uh, for them to know Jesus as their Lord, whose they are, who they belong to. Um, But to come into their own, to be their own young women, and, and now at 27 and at 22, as I sit these last couple of weeks and have remembered, I've had a lot of time on my hands and um, have remembered and thought back and um, just watching them grow up, it's come to a point of, I think they are happy. And, and they have grown into young women that are pursuing their own dreams, their own goals, their own lives. Um, both of them, um, are in, in a field of, of service of, of some kind. Um, and, and they know who they are. And I look back and think how proud Joanna and I are of who, who Caitlin and Casey have grown to be. And who they are as young women and who they are as young women of Christ and as a father I I am so proud, I can't even begin to explain. Not that I've done everything right. So much of this has been done by so many other people. Um, But I also stop and think that we don't necessarily agree on everything. Our opinions aren't exactly the same on everything. And yet there is such, we have just lucky, knock on wood, I guess, I don't know, been cultivated over the years, this deep bond and love within our family that we can talk about things and have differing opinions and talk about things. And there is still, we listen, we hear, and we still love deeply. It does not affect our love for each other. And as I've thought about that over the last couple of weeks and everything that's been happening in the world and, and, it, and I've just become, I've had a weight on my heart. And this morning, I'm just going to speak to you from my heart. And, and um, I just, some things have been weighing on me and, and, and I just see with all the turmoil and crisis in the world. And I just, in, in some ways, I just see love as lacking. It seems that we, we are taking sides that instead of being united in everything, beginning with this virus, COVID-19, that, that hopefully would have united us, it has is, is almost divided us in so many ways. And I, I'm, I'm picking on both sides. You lean right, you lean left, blue, red. We all have picked our side and we have used things to divide us instead of unite us. And with the tragic deaths over the last couple of weeks, 
that we've all seen in the news and it, it has just served to further that divide instead of unite in some ways. In some ways, there is a uniting, but again, it is happening on a side and another side is uniting. And I don't see a lot of love between the sides. And, and I just go back to this, this verse as the gospel of John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17 is where I'm going to begin today. And Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says this to them. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command to you so that you will love one another. Jesus is speaking to his disciples in this, this narrative in the gospel of John that we call the farewell discourse. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure, his crucifixion and his departure. And he's talking to them about what is to come and, and how things are going to be. And he says, I give you a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. Now this commandment goes beyond the earlier one of love your neighbor as yourself. Because loving your neighbor as yourself brings in all of those human frailties and sinfulness that we carry with us. Selfish, ego, what's in it for me? If I do this for you and if I love you this way, what's in it for me? And Jesus' love for us is different. There is no selfishness. There is no pride, no ego. There is no what is, what's in it for me. This love of Jesus, agape love, unconditional. No concern for what I get out of it. Concerned only what is best for you. And there is what I've been struggling with the last several weeks. And, and I think as we look at this, and, and I think if we can step back and look at uniting, at unity instead of division. If you move the word or the letter I in united one place over, it becomes untied. And I think that's what we're seeing in our world. We're becoming untied, unraveled, pulled apart instead of drawn together in so many ways and becoming united. And I think we, 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 we have gone down this road of picking enemies and opponents Instead of realizing there is only one enemy, Satan. And instead of uniting against him, we are picking others in the world. And Jesus has told us we have one mission in this world as the church. To go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's our mission. That's what we stand for. That's the calling of the church the ecclesia, the called out ones. That's our mission, to help people know the life-giving love and grace of our Savior Jesus. And sadly, though, I worry the church in our world and our culture today, what is the church known for? Is it known for unity? Is it known for love? Is it known for grace? And sadly, I will have to say, if we ask just the ordinary odd person on the street, what is the church known for? Some people are going to say, well, the traditions of the church. Others people might say, well, the architectural style and the beauty of the buildings. Some people would talk about style as far as, well, they're a traditional church or a contemporary church, or they have this really cool worship leader with the long hair and the man bun and the skinny jeans and the tattoos um, and wh whatever that is. Um, and so often... We're known for what we are against, what we don't like. Oh, they don't like this and they don't believe in that. And they don't go to there or to those places. They don't associate with that type of person too often. 
And too often when people think about the church, they tend to think about what we are against. What about instead of being known for what we're against, what if us as followers of Jesus, we were known for what we were for? For love and grace and mercy and compassion and justice and generosity. See, the Bible gives us one example and only one of how the world will know that we are followers of Jesus, that we are the church, we are the ecclesia, we are the called out ones. In a similar verse to what we just read, this comes from John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And Jesus says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What if that was us? Wouldn't it be amazing if people talked about Christians and talked about the church and the body of Christ and say things like, did you see that person forgive? Did you see the grace that they displayed to others? Did you see the compassion and the empathy that they showed and displayed with those others? It's mind blowing how they go out of their way to care for others and to love others. Even when it's hard, even when they don't get anything out of it, they still love, they still care, they still serve. I may not completely agree with all that they do, but they always stand with the oppressed and they always give to those that are hurting. And oh, the church down the street, they helped rebuild my house after the tornado or they visited me in prison and now I'm different because of the love that they showed. What would happen if that's who we were? If that's what we showed, we were true disciples of Jesus. We loved one another as he loved us. He loved us when we were sinners, when we were in rebellion, when we acted out against him and yet he still loved us to the point of dying on that cross for us. What if we loved like that? with one mind, one mission, one heart for those that are in need, for those that are oppressed, for those that need our love and our grace and our mercy. What if we accept one another, as Paul says, just as Christ accepted us in order to bring praise to God? You want to glorify God, accept one another. You love one another. That will bring glory to God. See, Scripture tells us that while we were still sinners, while we deserved nothing at all but judgment from Christ, He died for the unrighteous and the imperfect. He loved you that much when you were not only imperfect, but you were unrighteous. And you were sinning against a holy God and God still loved you. And that's how we accept one another the same way Christ accepted you. Where does unity start? It starts with me. And it starts with you. It starts with us as the church, as the ecclesia, as the called out ones. And right now, we're a nation of people becoming untied, unraveled, as I said, divided, ripped apart. And I ask myself why, and to so many of us, this is my heart because so many of us are so arrogant thinking that our perspective is the only way, that our way is the only way. And what I would like to say to you is Jesus, Jesus is the only way. And our perspectives of how we see the world can vary greatly, but we can be unified around the truth that Jesus is the son of God and Jesus has changed lives. What do we need? We have one enemy and he's very real. He's attacking and he's attacking now. And we have one mission and is indescribably important. And I believe with all my heart that the world is sick and tired of hearing Jesus talk. Hear me out. They don't want to keep hearing us talk about him. 
and just talk about him. They want to see him. They want to see Jesus in action. So let's stop talking and start loving. Let's grow up, church. Let's not enter into social media battles and just kind of blow up. As a matter of fact, it may be time to be reading more scripture and less social media. Let's not keep our heads buried and searching for every news tidbit that comes along. Maybe it's time for more time in prayer and less time in the television. We don't change anything by blowing up at people. We change by love. But we have to realize that we're in a very real spiritual war and the side is not against right versus left. It's the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness and together we unify around the truth and the power of Jesus. What does Jesus do? Well, yes, we can all agree racism is a problem. Prejudice, racism, bigotry, all problems. And yet the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus can melt even the strongest teachings of bias or bigotry or prejudice or racism. The love of Jesus. It is a heart thing. If we will love others as Jesus has has loved us, these issues, racism, oppression, prejudice, begin to melt away in the power and the name of Jesus Christ. So I invite you this morning to just think about it and to understand and remember there's only one way the Bible says people will know we are followers of Jesus. It's not by how we look. It's not by how we worship or how we vote. It's by how we love one another. A new commandment I give to you Love one another as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's a heart thing. Love of you as you have been loved by the conqueror of death and sin. Love as he has loved us. Gracious and loving God, hear us as we cry out to you this morning to change hearts, to help us to recognize those who are so desperately in need of your love. And may we be your disciples. May they know we are your your disciples by the way we love them with grace and mercy and forgiveness. And may we love in a way that is not for us, but for you and through you and only by your power. May we unite in love and grace and peace. And may we look for justice and oppression. And may through that love, we begin to melt. We begin to melt these issues from everyone's hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit. In his name, amen.